explanation. Indeed, it may be correct. There's nothing intrinsically wrong about this. It's a viable historical account. But at the same time, I think we can say that this is the Daco Roman myth of Romanian origins. Why do we say that? Well, one reason why we say that is that I think we can demonstrate that it's wrong. And this is quite a good sign that something is a myth if uh, it, it, you can just demonstrate that it's wrong. But that's not the only reason why we would categorize this as a myth. It's, it's a myth of origins and it's a myth of identity. I mean, it's a sort of governing belief that has a deep purpose to it, which involves generating certain claims about identity that generate further claims in relation to others. Obviously, in this case, claims in relation to the ethnic Hungarians who live in Transylvania, because the great concern of Romanian nationalist history has always been to show that we, the Romanians, got there first, or perhaps didn't even get there. We just always were there, and the Hungarians came later. It's a classic example of that sort of dispute. So, just being wrong is not enough to demonstrate that this is a myth. We have to look at the way it functions and at the deep assumptions and where those come from. It uses history, but in some sense it is deeply ahistorical or unhistorical because its purpose is to assert a permanent, eternal essence of remainingness that has always been there and has not changed. So let me just add as a footnote to that example, it's possible that the factual claim can be correct, and yet at the same time that people hold it for myth-related reasons. For example, I think, although nothing is very clear about the origins of the Albanians, the evidence, the balance of evidence, shows that they were probably descended from the ancient Illyrians. I think that is the best historical answer we can give, and there is evidence for it. But if you look at the long history of writing on the subject, Albanians were passionately arguing that they were Illyrians, long before we had the sort of modern critical investigation of the topic that would generate a serious scientific answer to that question. So it may be that people can say the right thing historically, but still be doing it for mythical reasons. Now these deep myths, these framing myths, I think, are typically myths of identity. They're myths of origins, they're myths of essential connection to a territory, they're myths of unchanging characteristics, for example, eternal victimhood, that's a characteristic of some natural myths, or constant heroism and resistance, that's another classic syndrome. Myths of constant purpose, that the underlying purpose of the great historic acts of the people has always been in one direction. Myths of resistance and liberation. And I think every society, every country, seems to have some element of this in relation to its understanding of its own history. So if we accept in the now classic phrase that nations are imagined communities, we should also think of them as being imagined communities over time. And a special kind of imagination has been used to bind together the long-term histories of these nations. And that sort of imagination, again and again, has taken the form of these deep myths about the identity and origins and purpose of the people. So here we clearly have a kind of functionality which is quite similar to what the anthropologists were talking about in their functional account of myth in primitive society. It does build coherence and solidarity in the group if the members of the group all believe the same basic things about the coherence and solidarity of their group over time. But the function usually goes further than just being something internal to the group to create solidarity. Typically, the deep purpose of these myths is towards others. Uh, it's not just a marker of identity in the way that perhaps your 
your music or your cuisine can be a, a marker of your group identity. It's typically purposive, and the purpose involves your relations to neighbors or other groups, uh, relations that may be positive or negative. It's not necessarily a call to direct action against others, but it may just be a way of distinguishing your society as you conceive of it historically from the other societies. And that is the sort of purpose behind it, a purposive difference. I'll just give you a small example. Recently, I was in Malta working in the archives there. I'd never been to Malta before. I was reading about the history of Malta uh, before I went. And this is a very interesting history, this small rocky island, historically not very important until 1530, when the Knights of St. John, the last sort of crusading order of knighthood active in the Mediterranean world, were moved there and given it as their headquarters. And then it became what it has been since then, a so-called bastion of Christianity against the Islamic world. Now, if you listen to people talking in Maltese, it is obvious that this is really a uh, sort of dialect of Arabic. And that is what it is. We don't know exactly where it came from. The, the latest theory is that it was a migration from Sicily. Um, when the Normans invaded in the Middle Ages, the Sicilian Arabic-speaking people, a large group of them, moved to Malta. But whatever the origins, it's fairly Arabic. But they don't call it Arabic, they don't like to have it described as Arabic. And for a long time in the national history of Malta, they have said the origin of our language and of our people is from the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians being uh, people who were mentioned in the Bible, originally from the coast of what is now Lebanon, great traders who moved to North Africa, Carthage, the Carthaginians, uh, or Punic people, Punic, Phoenician, it's the same word. Uh, this was their origin. Now, why this story, which is pretty mythical? Well, because in this way, they could invent a separate tradition that had nothing to do with Arabs as such, and nothing to do with Arabic language, because in this period, as a so-called bastion of Christianity, they did not want to identify with Arabs, because the Arabs near them on the North African coast were all Muslims. That was the society they were fighting against. And so a different story was invented. This seems to me a classic example of a national myth with a definite purpose to it. Now, where did that come from? It didn't just come up from national con consciousness, from folk uh, traditions or whatever. It was invented, and it was invented by intellectuals uh, from the Renaissance period onwards. Um, so really, this is a top-down process. It's not coming up from folk beliefs. It's coming down from the higher levels of the educated strata who have these interests more or less at a conscious level in their mind. So this is where ideology comes in. Uh, because I think we're not just talking, as the anthropologists are, about things that have developed in a rather mysterious way over time. We're talking about things that have been implanted, often quite deliberately, from above by educated and usually literate people. This top-down model that I'm suggesting may sound a little exaggerated. And you may think that surely there are many historical myths that people accept which have just come up gradually from sort of folk traditions and folk beliefs. Well, I just can't think of any major examples where that is true. I've tried. Um, Robin Hood, now becoming a, a Hollywood film, the great folk hero uh, of the English, uh, the bandit who robbed from the rich to give to the poor. There are learned studies of how this myth was developed and how the writers about it were following particular political agendas as they changed the story this way or that way. Perhaps at the most local level, there are small examples of local traditions that have just